Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Ijoma Oyato. Hello and welcome. House of Representatives asks federal government to ensure Unity schools participate in upcoming WIAC examination despite COVID-19 concerns. Senate passes bill recognizing boys and men as rape victims prescribes life imprisonment for kidnappers. Federal government goes ahead with recruitment of 774,000 youths for direct labor jobs, which has been a subject of controversy between the executive and the National Assembly. And more countries reimpose COVID-19 lockdown following spike in cases. Plus, we'll have business, sports, news from Abuja, the FCT, and later on news from our studios in London. On business news tonight, Nigeria cuts oil outputs to 1.4 million barrels per day in June in latest reports released by OPEC. On sports news tonight, Real Madrid bans fans from gathering for celebrations if they win the Spanish La Liga over a possible risk of contracting COVID-19. And from Abuja, federal government insists PNID gas contract is a scam conceived with full intent to defraud Nigeria. Shows London court new evidence on claim. There has been an amendment to the nation's criminal code as the Senate removed the statute on limitations on sexual offences and pronounced boys and men victims of rape. Part of the amendment to the criminal code also includes the prescription of life imprisonment for kidnappers. The senators say the frequency of kidnapping across the country makes it imperative to review the country's laws to ensure appropriate punishment for perpetrators. With the National Assembly to please. It's the first plenary session for the week, and legislators have before them a bill seeking to amend the criminal code. The bill to amend the criminal code is sponsored by Senator Lure Mitinumbu from Lagos State, presenting a report on the proposed legislation before the Senate. The Chairman Committee on Judiciary explains that the bill seeks to delete the statute of limitations on defilement in sections 218 and section 221 of the Criminal Code and amend the definition of rape in section 357. In addition, the bill seeks to provide stringent punishment for kidnapping. A woman is a woman, a girl is a girl, whether married or not. Or not. This is speaking as to content and as to consent. And the, the legislative intent here also is to remove gender restriction so that whether you are a man or a girl or a, 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 a woman, you know, whether you are a man or a woman, once somebody has unlawful uh, knowledge, it even takes it beyond canal knowledge. Now, penetration is not only through uh, the traditional uh, uh, means, it can even be through the mouth or nose, or anus, or any part of the body without consent. That is the legislative intent. The so, amendment scale through, and reading. the bill is passed. A bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code Act, Cap C-38 Laws of the Federation of Nigeria 2004, to delete the statute of 2023 being taken and passed. Congratulations. The upper chamber also debates a motion on the need to resuscitate the rehabilitation and concession of the Eastern Rail Line project. The sponsor of the motion argues that the Eastern Rail Line is suffering neglect and is being denied the attention given to the Lagos Kanu Western Rail Line despite the economic benefits to the country. More disturbed that in spite of being the most lucrative route in Nigeria, passing through Aba in Abia State, the commercial nerve center of the southeast is regrettably left in comatose condition, a resulting Nigerian Railway Corporation losing at least 10.4 billion each year since 2004, totaling about 63 billion 
in the past six years. The Senate goes on to urge the executive to prioritize the commencement of the rehabilitation and concession agreement for the Eastern Corridor and also directs its Committee on Land Transport to interface with the relevant government agencies to achieve this. From the Senate, we move to the House of Representatives, where the lawmakers are asking President Muhammadu Buhari to direct the Ministry of Education to ensure that students in Unity schools participate in this year's WAYEC examination. The decision of the House is coming on the heels of a pronouncement by the Minister of Education that no Unity school would participate in the senior secondary school certificate examinations earlier scheduled to hold from August the 3rd to September the 5th, 2020. Our correspondent, Terry Ikumi, reports. The directive by the Federal Minister of Education to public schools to boycott the senior school certificate examination scheduled to commence from the 3rd of August has caught the attention of the House of Representatives. It was raised as a matter of urgent public importance by Representative Naji Noli, and according to him, that decision was not well thought out. Worried that Nigeria's non-participation in the year's examination pertains serious psychological, socioeconomic, and health effect on the students as well as the already overburdened parents and guardians. Also worried that the negative and cumulating effect of the government action in seeking to withdraw Nigerian students from the examination will be devastating on our educational system and Nigeria's economy at large. The West African Examination Council is the body which determines the examinations required in the English-speaking West African countries, which include Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Liberia and the Gambia, for award of the junior and senior secondary school certificates. While the Minister of Education insists that it is not prepared to risk the lives of Nigerian students during the COVID-19 pandemic, the House fears that it could portray a negative image for the country. Also worried that this sudden policy reversal is and will be detrimental and create further confusion and uncertainty in the educational sector, as well as frustrate the students' lifelong ambition and send down signal to stakeholders and investors. The examinations were initially scheduled to commence on the 5th of April this year, but postponed to the 3rd of August due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The House also resolves to urge the Minister of Education to implement the national safety protocols on COVID-19 to ensure safety of students during the examination. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Despite the suspension of the federal government's special public works program by the National Assembly, the federal government says the program has kicked off across the country. And this was announced on the Twitter handle of the federal government, which clarified that the state selection committees have been inaugurated and commenced work, saying names and contract details of members of each state's committee are stated in the special work website. Earlier, sources in the presidency told Channels Television that President Muhammadu Buhari met with the Minister of State for Labour, Mr. Festus Kiyamo, and directed him to continue with the programme, which is aimed at providing employment for 774,000 Nigerians. Mr. Kiyamo had engaged the Senate committee members in an altercation during a public hearing over who would oversee the execution of the scheme, with the minister accusing the National Assembly of challenging the president by their actions. However, the Minister of Labour and Employment, Dr. Chris Ngige, later apologised to the lawmakers over the matter. It's the second day of the warning strike called by doctors under the Medical Guild in Lagos State over issues affecting their welfare and safety. The Medical Guild says more than 200 doctors involved in the fight against COVID-19 have tested positive for the disease and is also accusing the state government of painting its members in bad light over the three-day warning strike. Meanwhile, the state government is appealing to them to return to work, but the doctors insist the issues are recurring and unresolved. Our correspondent, Dare Do, reports. To activate the resolution of the Congress on a three-day warning strike to commence... It's a warning strike, expected to last for three days. Doctors working in the state COVID-19 isolation centers are joined in the long list of issues, but exempted from joining the action called by the Guild.
A visit to the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital shows skeletal medical services are rendered with priority given to emergency cases only. It's a peculiar time in medical profession and Lagos, the epicenter of COVID-19, cannot afford a dispute with frontline workers. Two months have been owed these doctors. As I speak to you, I've not gotten feedback yet whether they have received it as of today. But I know that as at yesterday, these same doctors working in isolation centers are yet to receive two months pending of these allowances. The state government says it is disappointed over the action of the doctors for downing tool, especially at a time like this. The governor wants the doctors to show empathy and return to work. We need to be sure that the people that were going to be paying the COVID allowance to were people that had worked during this COVID period and had worked in one or all of our isolation centers, right? So we had a two month delay, meaning that we paid two months, then we had not paid um, May and June. As I speak this morning, all of them, most of them, if not all of them, are the allowance for the two month areas. When the doctors decide to return to work, a list of issues they want resolved may still be hanging. Within Lagos alone, you have five tertiary health institutions. And you find that in these institutions, they are employing their doctors, their residents, medical officers, on commerce three, step three, which is equivalent to grade level 13, step three. Whereas for Lagos State, we are being employed at a level of grade level 12. Any of us, especially them at this time, we want to take an opportunistic approach because of the pandemic system or the pandemic crisis we are going through. I think it's rather unfortunate. The Guild says the strike was inevitable after the government Activity. failed to meet 70% of its demand. The Congress is expected to reconvene after the three-day warning strike. To review its plan, it is unclear whether the government's current intervention is enough to change the course of action. Dari Idu, Channel Television News. And some good news in the fight against COVID-19. The Delta State Governor Ifanyo Okowa, his wife Edith, and their daughter have all tested negative for the virus. The governor said in a tweet today, my wife, my daughter and I have tested negative for COVID-19, along with other members of the family. We give God all the praise and we wish to appreciate all who have interceded for us in prayers. Dr. Okowa and his wife tested positive on July the 1st and went into isolation for necessary treatment. Their daughter had tested positive for the virus a few days earlier. Some government officials have also tested negative after initially testing positive. You may have symptoms that look like malaria in terms of maybe fever and the likes. But there are a number of other symptoms that are not uh, very, very peculiar to malaria. I have never had cause to lose my sense of smell. And so when that happens and you discover that no matter how ugly anything around you is in terms of smell or taste, you find it very difficult to uh, understand. And then also you begin to, if you don't take care of your respiratory tract and your respiratory system, the tendency that you are likely going to find it very difficult to breathe. I am nine years old in taking blood pressure drugs, nine years, consistently. So if I can go through that and come out, then any other person can go through it and come out. It is not a death sentence. Meanwhile, in Anambra State, Governor Willie Obiano has directed the police to arrest fake COVID-19 task force officials operating in the state. Governor Obiano disclosed this in a special broadcast at the Governor's Lodge on Isha, while giving an update on the latest development in the war against the spread of the virus. He wants the police to search out and arrest the criminal elements for prosecution. The fake COVID-19 task force officials have been reportedly arresting people and extorting huge sums of money under the guise of working for the state government. I wish to make it categorically clear that the only agencies authorized to enforce the Anambra State COVID-19 law are the members of Ocha Brigade, ATMA, that is Anambra traffic management agency, and the trained agents in all our markets. 
any other agency or group of people masquerading as COVID-19 task force on the streets of Anambra State is fake. And, then I, and I want to quickly warn these fake operators that the Nigerian police force has been directed to search for and arrest all those and prosecute those criminals. In part two after the break, federal government tells British court it's uncovered previously unknown payments to the daughter of a Nigerian official in its latest attempt to overturn an arbitration award. That's in a moment. Do join us again. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. House of Representatives asks federal government to ensure Unity schools participate in upcoming WIAC examination despite COVID-19 concerns. Senate passes bill recognizing boys and men as rape victims, describes life imprisonment for kidnappers. Federal government goes ahead with the recruitment of 774,000 youths for direct labor jobs, which has been a subject of controversy between the executive and the National Assembly. And more countries reimpose COVID-19 lockdown following spike in cases. Our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Do subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channel TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android, Fire TV and Roku as well. Now, the federal government has told a British court it's uncovered previously unknown payments to the daughter of a Nigerian official in its latest attempt to overturn an arbitration award against it with close to $10 billion. And we'll take that story from my colleague in Abuja as I hand over to her now. Hey, Linda. Hello, Ijoma. Welcome to Abuja. The federal government has told a British court it has uncovered previously unknown payments to the daughter of a Nigerian official in its latest attempt to overturn an arbitration award against it worth close to $10 billion. Process and Industrial Development, BNID, a firm set up to carry out a gas project in Nigeria, won a $6.6 billion arbitration award after the 2010 deal collapsed. The award has been accruing interest since 2013 and is now worth nearly $10 billion. Nigeria is seeking permission in the English courts to appeal the awards granted in 2017, despite having missed the 28-day appeal deadline. It says new information came to light only in late 2019. In an online court hearing, the government's lawyer said it has evidence of payments from companies related to P&ID to Vera Tega 11 days before the deal was signed. Vera Vera's mother, Grace Tega, was the chief lawyer for the Petroleum Ministry, ministry at the time. The government said one payment of $4,969.50 was made on December 30, 2009, and a second of $5,000 on January 31, 2012. It also says the payments came to light following a U.S. discovery order in New York. The government also said PNID officials and companies linked to it paid several other officials in relation to the deal. The FCC had charged Grace Tegar last year with accepting bribes and failing to follow protocol related to the contract. She has pleaded not guilty and awaits trial. Now, suspected international fraud star Raymond Abbas, a.k.a. Ray Hush Poppy, has been denied bail by a court in the Northern District of Illinois. The court ruled that the self-acclaimed billionaire Gucci master, who has over 2.5 million followers on Instagram, will remain in detention until his trial later this year over money laundering allegations. Hush Poppy will be transported to Los Angeles by the United States Marshal Service and will not be allowed to stay with his girlfriend's uncle in Homewood, Illinois. 
His trial is slated to be held in Los Angeles, where the case was filed, rather from Chicago, where the investigation is being handled. At the hearing, Hosh Poppy's lawyer denied that his client was a flight risk or a danger to the community, as he repeatedly rejected the allegations made against him by the FBI. He's accused of being part of a network that made hundreds of millions of dollars from business email compromise frauds and other scams. Now, still on legal issues, the Supreme Court has declared that virtual court proceedings are constitutional. The living judgment on the suit filed by the Attorney General of Lagos and Ekiti States challenging the constitutionality of virtual court sittings. A seven-man panel of the Apex Court, led by Justice Olabade Rodrigo, held that virtual court sittings are presumed to be valid and have not been declared unconstitutional by anybody. The court held that the suit is predicated on speculation as the National Assembly is yet to amend the nation's constitution as regards virtual court sittings. The constitutionality of virtual court proceedings is the sole issue for determination as the Supreme Court entertained the suit filed by the Attorneys General of Lagos and Ikiti State. The applicants in their separate suits argued that there is no constitutional provision for virtual court proceedings which has made many judges to stop sitting for fear of litigants and lawyers challenging the process. Members of a seven-man panel, however, dismissed the fear set to be entertained by many judges as the constitutionality of virtual court sittings in the country. They maintained that the chief judges of the state that had issued practice direction to provide for virtual proceedings when convenient had the duty to enforce the directive. The panel described the suit of both the Lagos and Ikiti State's Attorneys General as speculative as the suit did not disclose how virtual proceedings had injured the interest or rights of anyone. The Attorney General of Lagos State and his counterpart from Ikiti State later withdrew the suit after members of the panel described them as academic and speculative. We have submitted uh, issues to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in its wisdom has decided that um, the time is not ripe for those issues to be sorted out. Although it is gratifying that um, the presiding judge did say that virtual sittings were not unconstitutional, so we, we take what we may from that. We are disappointed, but uh, that is the Supreme Court. Um, we have thought that this is an issue that goes to the very root of uh, legal practice uh, in Nigeria. Um, the uh, livelihood of lawyers depend on it. It is also a public health issue. Uh, the health situation of lawyers and judges also depend on this suit. While Lagos State filed its suit challenging the powers of the National Assembly to amend Section 274 of the Constitution, which seeks to include virtual proceedings in the Constitution, Ekiti State had urged the court to make an affirmative decision on the issue to remove the speculations and uncertainties being entertained about it by judges. Meanwhile, the Apex Court has also dismissed the appeal by an aspirant in the Bayelsa State governorship election, Mr. Timi Alaibe, challenging the candidacy of Mr. Doye Diri as a PDP flag bearer in the November 2019 poll. In dismissing the suit, the Apex Court held that the suit was a pre-election matter. Mr. Alaibe had earlier lost a similar suit at the Federal High Court and the Court of Appeal. He had claimed that he was the authentic candidate of the PDP in the election. And staying with legal matters, the Federal High Court sitting in Benin City has adjourned hearing on corruption charges against Edo State APC's governorship candidate, Pastor Sage Ize Yamu, and four others by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. The court adjourned after hearing of the applications of the Defence Council, asking for more time to put forth an appropriate reaction to the motion against the defendants, while also challenging the jurisdiction of the court. The presiding judge, Justice Umar Garba Mohammed, ruled in favor of the application and consequently adjourned further hearing till the 15th of October 2020. 
It's fresh trouble for the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, as it is unable to defend its 2019 budget before the Senate and House of Representatives Joint Committee on Niger Delta. The NDDC, led by its managing director, Professor Daniel Ponde, could not successfully defend the Commission's budget as the National Assembly Joint Committee pointed out discrepancies in it. What I can tell you today is that uh, they submitted a document to us. The document is confusing. We, there are discrepancies in figures. So we're saying to them, which one do you stand by? Do you adopt the whole document? Because if you do, it's going to help us do the 2020 budget, uh, since there are discrepancies. So, well, in their wisdom, they felt um, that they were going to withdraw the document and resubmit because there are a lot of discrepancies in what they submitted and there's no way you're going to do a budget when there are discrepancies in the previous year's budget. You have all seen what happened. We were ready for them to defend their budget, their 2020 budget. They are not ready. Their documents are faulty and you are there. They all admitted that the documents they submitted to us, they are faulty. Um, their revenue profile faulty. Many things, they said they're very faulty. So we have asked them to go back. Oh, they have asked. Not that we asked them. They pleaded with the committee to allow them to go back, to go and look at their papers again. And we graciously have granted them that they should go and look at their papers. The facts are there. The facts speak for itself. Let me make it clear. Whether you make any allegation against a lawmaker or not, we are not at all. All we are interested in is the facts. If you say, if anybody can make any allegation, and we keep on challenging anybody who has anything against us to produce the facts. It's not a question. It, you can open your mouth and say anything you want to say. You can talk from here to the fact. Do you have the fact? I have told you people that I challenge them. Anybody that has any fact about me can always. And so my, my colleague has done all the members here. So we, we, I didn't, we came here with the facts. I did not see the facts. Nigeria's economy and revenue earnings may be heading for a challenge if threats from the oil-bearing communities of Ijog, Baramatu Kingdom and Ishekiri come to fruition. The coastal communities of Wari Southwest local government area have renewed their earlier warnings demanding for key developmental projects or face the consequences of shutting down oil and gas installations in their communities. <laughs> It would have been inconceivable some 20 years ago that the sworn rival communities of Wari Southwest will sit next to each other in one room. <laughs> Elders, women and the young from the Jog Baramata Kingdom and their counterparts from the Shakiri oil and gas producing communities on the same roof and are unanimous for a common goal. Just last week, at separate instances, these groups held protests. Those protests had one thing in common. They threatened to shut down all oil and gas installations in their communities if the federal government would accede to their requests. Our intention to exercise restraint should not be seen as weakness. Let it be known, we will shut down all these oil installations. Those demands have not changed. They want the federal government to order the immediate resumption of work at the multi-billion dollar gas revolution industrial park project and the deep sea port in Wari. Federal government should halt the ongoing bidding process for the 57 marginal fields announced recently by the Department of Petroleum Resources and allow the doctrine of necessity which will allow indigenous of Isakiri and Guaramato Ijo the rights of first refusal for fields on their land. Federal government should direct the relevant MDAs and IOCs to embark on a large-scale shoreline protection for the coastline communities. Federal government should institute process for the facilitation of the abandoned Ageland Omidano Excravos Coco Ogbeye Road project. The immediate relocation of the floating dock ship building yard to enhance capacity building for the Nigeria Maritime University Okeren Coco as earlier envisaged. And finally, they want the federal government to instruct the Nigeria Port Authority through the Ministry of Transport to dredge the Escravos Bar Mouth in order to enhance the usage of Wari Koko Burutu and Sapele ports in Delta State. The Shakiri oil and gas produce, producing communities and the Baramatu job have been grossly marginalized in the bid offer since 
the discovery of crude oil in our homeland. One of the installations on this oil-rich coastal community is the $10 billion Scrubbers Gas to Liquid plant. From last year's projection, it has the potential to yield 2 billion naira yearly into the Federation's account. The threats the agitators believe can be assuaged if given some listening ears by the authorities. When the news return returns, Nigeria cuts oil output to 1.4 million barrels per day in June in latest report by OPEC. That's in business news. Join us again. Welcome back to the news at 10. The Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association of Nigeria, Pengerson, says the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation has fired 850 workers, many of them from refineries, amidst the coronavirus pandemic. A statement by Pengerson General Secretary Lumumba Okumagwa says the sacked workers include both skilled and unskilled contractors, including technicians who help maintain the nation's refineries. The NMPC is yet to confirm the claim, as they told Channels Television, that a formal response will be given on the matter tomorrow. Leading food and infrastructure conglomerate Bua Group has donated three ambulances and 200 million naira to the Adamawa state government to strengthen the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic in the state. At the presentation, one of the representatives of Bua Foundation and Director of Government Affairs at Bua Group, Dr. Aliwi Di Hong, says the gesture is in fulfillment of the country's pledge to work with Nigerians and in line with Bua's social responsibility obligations to the various efforts in the fight against the virus in the country. The Bua Foundation, through the chairman, has donated in excess of 7 billion naira all over the country, from the federal level to states to almost all over some agencies and, and uh, development partners. In continuation of his support to alleviate the suffering of governments and people, he has decided to donate the sum of 200 million naira to Adamawa State and also donated three ambulance vehicles to help State. The Adamawa State Governor Umaru Fintiri appreciated Bua Group for the response to the state's call for the support during the COVID-19 pandemic and commended the chairman of Bua Group, Abdul Samad Rabiu, for the prompt response. This came to us as a surprise from a very good Nigerian uh, that came, made his promise and fulfill it a day after, which is uh, very rare in this uh, uh, country. And I say kudos to him. And I want to tell the MD that we will make a very good use of these ambulances and the money that he has already given to us and is in the account of the coronavirus pandemic. So it's not a pledge, like has been said earlier. This, uh, this, uh, the money has been paid into our account and the vehicles are, and ambulances have been delivered today. So we say thank you and we want to assure you that we will put this vehicle and the money into good use for which it has been given to us. Over the past months, Boer Foundation has committed over 7 billion naira in cash, foodstuff, medical supplies and infrastructure towards various initiatives to assist the fight against COVID-19. Let's take a look at some business news now. Here's Tenyola Shobowali. Thanks, Ijeoma. Welcome to Business News. Latest figure released by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries shows that Nigeria cut its oil output from 1.7 million barrels per day in April to 1.4 million barrels in June 2020. According to OPEC's July oil market report released today, the reduction shows that the country is gradually complying with the output cut deal agreed in May by other members and allies of oil producers known as OPEC. 
OPEC plus. However, unofficial sources say Nigeria produced 1.5 million barrels of crude oil last month. Meanwhile, the OPEC report shows that additional voluntary production adjustments were made by top producers such as Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait in efforts made by the cartel to lift oil prices. The House of Representatives has endorsed Nigeria's candidate, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, for the position of Director General of the World Trade Organization, describing her as very qualified. The resolution to endorse her follows a motion raised by the minority leader of the House. The lawmakers are also asking President Mohamedou Buhari to rally support from other African leaders for her candidacy. The House is further aware that a distinguished Nigerian two-term minister of two-time minister of finance, one-time minister of foreign affairs, a former managing director of the World Bank, has formally nominated, has formally been nominated by the Federal Republic of Nigeria to via for the exalted position of the Director General of the World Trade Organization for the period of 2021 to 2025 and if successful, will be the first female and first Africa to have occupied this office. Aside Nigeria, Africa has two other candidates from Africa, from Egypt and Kenya, and entering the race with three candidates from Africa, we split Africa's votes, which cripples the prospect of an African assuming the World Trade Organization position. Therefore, we must urgently reach out to the governments of Egypt and Kenya on the need to rally around a single candidate for the continent in, in, in the person of a candidate that Nigeria has put forward. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, says Nigeria's revenue has dropped by over 40% due to the lockdown measure made to curtail the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. At a webinar by the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council, the Vice President mentioned that in January this year, before the pandemic, oil prices approached $70 a barrel for the first time since the crash of the 2015-2016, uh, which saw prices crash to sub $30 a a barrel. However, Professor Shibajo says although the country's huge informal economy also crashed during the period, it appears that silver linings have started appearing for the economy. Nigeria's headline inflation is projected to climb higher to 12.55% in June, up from 12.40% recorded in May. And that's according to latest forecasts by economic advisory firm Financial Derivatives. If the latest projection matches the official date due to be released by the National Bureau of Statistics, it will be the 10th consecutive monthly increase and the highest rate since 2018. Meanwhile, FDC hints that further the relaxation of the lockdown and lower consumers' disposable income could push prices down in the coming months. The National Bureau of Statistics is expected to release the country's June inflation figures tomorrow, Wednesday, July the 15th. More than 45 billion naira is knocked off from the stock market's total value today after a fresh round of profit taking hit the shares of tier one and mid cap banks. Bisi Adebayo tells us more. Hello and welcome to the stock market reports. It was a tough one for the NSS banking sector index as that sector took a serious beating on expectations that half-year reports which are expected to start trickling into the market soon may be unimpressive due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, traders say that investors don't want to be caught napping and so they are taking positions while they expect one or two results from the banking and the consumer goods sector which could probably help to lift the markets. As we can see here, Volume of transactions are still relatively low, and today's numbers were driven by the likes of Sterling Bank, UBA, and DePaul Oil. Now, all of these contributed to the extended decline in the oil share index. Traders hope that the market could witness minimal declines tomorrow, except a miracle turns things around. And that's it on the Stock Market Reports. I am BC Adibayo. <laughs> 
Thanks a lot, Bissy. Well, U.S. stock markets ended Tuesday's trading session in the green following a rally by industrial stocks on Wall Street. But let's find out how other major markets close for the day. business news tonight. It's back to you, Ijeoma. Thanks a lot, Teniola. 895 more Nigerians stranded in the United Kingdom and the United Arab Emirates arrived in Nigeria today. The last batch of UK returnees arrived at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, at exactly 8 p.m., while 261 others had earlier arrived at Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja. This brings the total number of UK returnees to 590. 305 returnees from the United Arab Emirates had earlier landed in Abuja. The Nigerians in Diaspora Commission and all the 895 returnees with that commission says they tested negative for COVID-19 and have been asked to isolate for 14 days. Still ahead on the news at 10, more countries impose COVID-19 lockdown following spike in cases. Plus more stories from our London studio in Around the World in 5. Just stick with us. Welcome back. The Trump administration has rescinded a rule that would have required international students to transfer schools or leave the country if their colleges hold classes entirely online this fall because of the coronavirus pandemic. U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement announced the decision at a court hearing as it was getting underway to challenge the rule by Harvard and MIT. Here's Simon Pusey with more international stories in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Millions of people around the world have gone back into lockdown as cities and states return to tighter coronavirus restrictions. In the US, California's governor has ordered all offices, bars and restaurants to close in a dramatic rolling back of reopening efforts. On the US East Coast, Florida has recorded more than 12,600 new cases in a single day, while the state is attempting to revive tourism and attract visitors. The US has reported roughly 60,000 new cases a day for almost a week. Hong Kong has imposed strict new social distancing measures, the most stringent there since the start of the pandemic, as authorities warned the risk of a large-scale outbreak was extremely high. A quarter of a million people in the Philippine capital Manila will return to lockdown in an attempt to stall the infection rate there. The Philippines has the second highest number of infections in Southeast Asia. French President Emmanuel Macron has announced he would like to see face masks mandatory in all public enclosed spaces, and this could come into effect on the 1st of August. It follows similar news from the UK, where the wearing of masks will become mandatory in English shops from the 24th of July. Meanwhile, the British government has announced it will ban Huawei 5G kits from mobile providers' national networks by 2027. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government has also government banned providers from buying new Huawei 5G equipment after the 31st of December this year. The decision follows sanctions imposed by the US due to concerns over national security. The government said the move would delay the country's 5G rollout by a year. New restrictions are also being applied to the use of the company's broadband kit, but the government did not believe in a security justification for removing 2G, 3G and 4G equipment supplied by Huawei. China says primary polls held by Hong Kong's pro-democracy parties were illegal. The primaries drew an estimated 600,000 people out to vote for democracy candidates. Beijing labelled the poll illegal and accused organisers of colluding with foreign powers. The city's leader, Carrie Lam, has announced an investigation. At least 10 people have died and dozens have been injured in a car bomb at a government compound in northern Afghanistan. 
Four Taliban militants clashed with security forces following the explosion. According to a local government spokesman, all the attackers were killed. It's another setback in the fragile peace talks brokered by the U.S. between the insurgents and the government in Kabul. At least four Azeri troops have been killed in two days of clashes involving tanks and artillery on Azerbaijan's border with Armenia. Azeri and Armenian defense ministries have accused each other of encroaching on their territory. The two former Soviet republics have long been in conflict over the contested region of Nagorno-Karabakh, although the latest clashes occurred almost 300 kilometers from the mountainous enclave. Thousands of opposition activists have marched across the Democratic Republic of Congo's capital, Kinshasa, in a new protest against the nomination of the head of the new electoral commission. Demonstrators continue to protest against the proposition of Ronsard Malonda as president of the Independent National Electoral Commission before being dispersed with tear gas by police. Three people died last week in nationwide protests against Mr. Malonga's nomination. A Malian alleged Islamist rebel who went on trial at the International Criminal Court for alleged war crimes is not fit to stand trial, that's according to his defense lawyers. Al Hassan Ag Abdul Aziz faces allegations over crimes including rape and destruction of Timbuktu holy sites. His defense cited a health expert report saying that Mr. Al Hassan was experiencing disassociation due to post-traumatic stress from severe maltreatment. Mr. Al Hassan faces 13 charges in total. The number of people injured on board a fire on a US warship has climbed to almost 60. Hundreds of firefighters have battled for a second day at a San Diego shipyard. The fire erupted on Sunday morning in the lower cargo hold of the ship and it was accompanied by at least one large explosion. The cause of the fire is still unknown. And finally, huge sheets have been placed over the Presenna glacier in Italy to try to slow the melting of the ice there. The glacier was covered with over 100,000 square meters of white geotextile sheets to reflect the sunlight during the summer and reduce the temperature of the permanent ice. The procedure has been carried out every year since 2008 and is designed to combat the effects of global warming. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thanks a lot, Simon. On to some sports now. Here's Olumide Mokoli. Thank you, Ijoma. Hello and welcome to Sports News. We begin with handball. The former president of the Confederation of Africa Handball, Larry Glover, believes handball in Nigeria is on the path towards achieving admirable development. Speaking at an online conference to celebrate the International Handball Week, Glover identified maladministration and poor funding as issues that led to the decline of the sport in the 1990s. However, is pleased with the recent programs of the current board of the federation and confident that if it's status sustained, the glory days of handball in Nigeria will return. In the English Premier League, Chelsea have recorded a routine 1-0 win over relegated Norwich City to boost their hopes of qualifying for next season's Champions League. Frenchman Olivier Giroud broke the deadlock in added time after heading home a Christian Pulisic cross to finally make the Blues' pressure count. Chelsea, Chelsea remain third and are now four points ahead of Manchester United and Leicester City. And that's it on Sports News. Ijama, back to you. Thanks, Olumide. And the main news again. The House of Representatives today asked the federal government to ensure that Unity schools are allowed to participate in the upcoming WIAC examination despite COVID-19 concerns. Also today, the Senate passed a bill recognizing boys and men as rape victims. The lawmakers also prescribed life imprisonment for kidnappers. And more countries today reimposed COVID-19 lockdown following the spike in cases. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Bonyato. Do have a good night and stay safe.